Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. Our goal today is to take the first important steps toward mastery of a really interesting enzyme, an enzyme called lysozyme. Let me remind you of why we'd be interested in enzymes in general, what our larger perspective is, and then zero in on the lysozyme case. So essentially, all functions that go on in your body or in any organism, all of biochemistry, almost all, is catalyzed by protein molecular machines that act as uh, agents to control the rates of reaction, so that the desirable reactions go at extremely rapid rates, and undesirable reactions are so slow as to be to make generally negligible contribution to the functioning of biochemical systems. And enzymes do that, protein machines do that, in very specific ways. One of the most important things they do, you'll recall, as we've talked about earlier, is to reduce the activation energy for transition from a uh, higher free energy state to a favorable lower free energy state to make that favorable reaction go rapidly. They reduce activation energy. We'll talk in a moment about one way in which a lysozyme does that. And they also uh, uh, juxtapose chemically reactive groups around the substrate that's going to undergo reaction so that the effective concentration of reactants is astronomically high, higher than you could realistically achieve as an organic chemist in solution, for example. And notice also that the underlying chemistry of this catalysis is simple. That's why I'm wearing a, a periodic table tie again today to emphasize the simple chemistry of biological organisms. So the function of enzymes is complicated only in the sense that all the amino acid residues in the protein have to be positioned just right in order to lower the activation energy and provide high concentrations of the local reactants. The hard work, in other words, the complicated work, is done by evolution by natural selection, creating this specific sequence of amino acids that will execute these tasks. As you'll see, the under the underlying organic chemistry of the tasks that are executed is, in fact, in general, surprisingly simple. So watch for that today, the simplicity of the underlying chemistry of lysozyme once you have the right amino acid sequence to do the task. So let's put lysozyme in context. This is an artist's reconstruction of bacterial cells, the smaller things here, in the immediate environment of a large uh, human white blood cell for example. To give you a sense of scale, a bacterial cell is about two microns long, typical one, give or take. This is another artist's reconstruction, artist's representation of a bacterial cell, a typical coliform bacterial cell. The outer uh, uh, part of the bacterial surface, called a cell wall, is rigid and protects the cell from exploding, for example, due to uh, uh, isotonic uh, uh, lysis. It, otherwise, it would swell with water rushing into the concentrated solutes in the cell, and the plasma membrane of the cell would expand and ultimately rupture and lyse. The cell wall uh, restrains that, uh, keeps that from happening among many other functions. Lysozyme is an enzyme that's designed to degrade cell walls and lyse bacterial cells. It's an antibacterial agent, for example. It occurs in many places. It's in the tears in your eyes, for example. It's also very abundant in egg white. <coughs> It's also very abundant in egg white, not um, for, for obvious reasons, to protect the young developing embryo from bacterial assault until its own immune system is up and going with later development. So lysozyme is all over the place, and eggs are, of course, relatively cheap. Huge amounts of egg white lysozyme can be uh, purified and worked with. Lysozyme also turns out to be a relatively small, easy-to-work-with enzyme. So, in fact, lysozyme is one of the most well-understood enzymes in all of biochemistry and was one of the first to be characterized. So we're going to be looking at all of the things we've learned from this long history of the study of this particular enzyme, all the different lessons that we've learned. And, of course, we're not really concerned only with lysozyme, but we're concerned more generally with how enzymatic catalysis works. How does natural selection go about producing the molecular machines that will execute tasks like this? So let's look at the first of several things that lysozyme does in order to hydrolyze this molecule. So let's look first at the molecule that's actually being hydrolyzed. The short segment of it here, this is a uh, <coughs> polysaccharide segment of the more complex proteoglycan, I'm sorry, peptidoglycan molecule that makes up the bacterial cell wall. Notice that it's made of alternating N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylneuramic acid residues, NAG and NAM, respectively for short. Let me just show you this is an N-acetylglucosamine residue. Notice that it's glucose, except at the lower right there is an amino group in place of what would normally be a hydroxyl group, and an amide linkage to it there is an acetyl group, Hen hence ince acetyl glucose amine. N-acetylneuramic acid is very similar. Notice that it looks just like and acetyl uh, glucose, uh, glucosamine, except that there's an additional uh, pyruvate 
moiety projecting off of it. In fact, we're not going to be terribly interested here in the acetyl groups and the, the pyruvic acid groups, pyruvate groups that are projecting out of the, the polypeptide chain. The enzyme cares because it's going to use those to interact with, and we'll look at that in a moment. We're going to make, be more concerned with the uh, acetyl linkage the, between the, um, uh, these residues, including the linkage that's cleaved. You'll notice it indicated here at the center of this image, and we're going to come back and look at it repeatedly over the next few minutes. So this is a representation of the crystal structure of lysozyme, together with where w it is believed that the substrate binds. Notice that uh, a whole string of uh, monosaccharide units in the polysaccharide are bound to the enzyme. We'll look at those in a little more detail in a moment. Uh, this Positioning here is a combination of X-ray crystallographic analysis of bound partial substrates and some some pretty reliable model building, we think. So in, we, we believe we have a pretty clear idea of how the substrate binds, and the initial substrate binding is ultimately a big part of catalysis, as you'll see over the next couple of minutes. So let's get oriented. There is the polysaccharide chain down the middle of the uh, enzyme, uh, a, a, a cleft in the enzyme that binds the polysaccharide chain. And notice that there are uh, six sugars actually bound, just labeled A through F. So A, B, C, D, E, and F. And in fact, in the middle here are a, a glutamate and an aspartate residue, which we're going to have a lot to say about later, and the D and E um, monosaccharide units between which the cleavage event will occur. So let's zero in and, and look at the details of that D ring in particular, as you'll see is important, uh, for um, uh, understanding how lysozyme is going to drive catalysis by controlling the conformation of the bound substrate. Okay. So here's just a different view of that same set of six um, monosaccharide units making up a part of the substrate, together with selected amino acids from lysozyme. And what I want you to notice in this slightly complicated diagram is all of the different hydrogen bonds that are made between the substrate polysaccharide and the amino acid sub, uh, 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 side chains of the end. There are a lot of them. And in addition to these hydrogen bonds, the positioning of the polysaccharide uh, with, uh, uh, as a result of these hydrogen bonds also drives the formation of a series of, of uh, 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 van der Waals interactions uh, and other things that stabilize the polysaccharide substrate in just the right conformation. Very important. So not only do the enzyme side chains that are contributing to the chemistry have to be in just the right place, evolution by natural selection, but they have to also grip and position the substrate in just the right place in order to make the chemistry go quickly and with low activation energy. All right, our primary concern at the moment is not all the chemistry, that'll come in just a couple of minutes, but how the binding of the substrate to the enzyme through all of these connections positions in particular the D ring. So this is just, I'm just blowing up that center of that uh, um, image to show you where the lysozyme cut is again, and notice that the D ring is distorted relative to the surrounding C and E rings. That's a little hard to see here. I'm going to show you two in a slightly different way in a moment. It will be a little easier to understand, but that is going to be absolutely crucial. The D ring is distorted to look like the transition state in the desired catalytic reaction, thereby reducing the activation energy of achieving that transition state. Let's look at how that's done. There's the D-ring that we're concerned with right in the middle. So let's get some background. This is glucose, and glucose can exist in several different configurations, the so-called chair configuration, but the preferred configuration is the one shown here at left. The bulky groups, symbolized in green, all project outward away from the ring, uh, uh, equatorially, as it's said, whereas the less desired uh, conformation at the right, these bulky groups are bumping into one another and are projected uh, axially into the center of the monosaccharide. But this is the prefer preferred chair conformation. What, we're, what I want to show you in the next couple of minutes is the D-ring normally occupies this configuration, this chair configuration, but it's distorted into what's called a half-chair configuration as a result of the binding to the lysozyme uh, enzyme that you saw just a moment ago. So at the bottom here is the chair configuration of the uh, relevant D-ring, uh, N-acetylglucosamine ring. And again, we're not paying attention to the substituents here. We're just looking at the cyclic carbons and oxygens. 